Greetings everyone, hello and welcome to Chilitracy. Happy Wednesday! Hello, hope we're all doing well. Um, yeah, sorry it's been a little while. It's been a while? No. Um, yeah, it's been been a, 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 a week. Actually, no, wait. I didn't stream last week. I had a stinking cold the week before and then I didn't stream last week either. Basically we've we've accidentally sort of had a, re a week off um, which I think we both needed. Um, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Well I sincerely hope so. Um, Parola you are starting to get a bit tired from the madness on Dave's stream so some chilled reading will be nice now. Okay. What's he playing? He's playing something horror based am I right in saying? Uh, maybe? Not sure. But yes, hello everybody. It's lovely to be back. Lovely to see you all here. Hello to Parola. Hello Lady Mephistopheles. Andy, thank you very much for the 19 month sub. Helmanson, welcome in. Uh, who else we got? I think that was it. Oh, Sam, obviously. I think I, I, think I do this every time. I just I say hi to everybody and then... Oh yeah, Sam exists as well. It's lethal company except about making content instead of collecting scrap. Horror man. Oh, wait, is it, it's not phas... Is it Phasmophobia he's playing? No. Sam is implied, he is. Always implied. The Sam is always implied. Excuse me, slurping. I have tea. You're part of the furniture. Yes. Oh, it's literally called content warning. Oh, right. Okay. I see. For some reason, I thought that, like, the content warning wasn't, like, actually, was actually him saying, content warning, there's some stuff in here that might be upsetting. But, uh, nope. Got you now. Right. Marvellous. Um, but yes, how how is everybody doing? Um, yeah, Lady Mephistopheles, I, I hope you, you get some something to help with your cough. That's not fun. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope we can... Oh, excuse me. I hope we can um, help you all chill. We've got part three of uh, Pride and Prejudice. Um, Sam is that pile of books next to the armchair yes correct it's a very good disguise he's been working on it for a while but um, but yes I hope for those of you who uh, um, well not even those of you who celebrate Easter but I hope anybody who's had, had a sort of family family weekend over Easter I hope that's been good um Mine was loud, um, but wasn't too bad. Um, that was what he called a style furniture music. Yes, this is true. Um, but yes, Sam and I uh, went to a very nice place um, near me, which does, which I've been harping on at him about for ages, um, which does non-alcoholic foraged drinks like all of the ingredients they use in their drinks are all foraged locally and they're great and I've been there a couple of times now and they're just wonderful um, and I've been yeah saying to Sam oh I should take you there I must take you there and then we actually went and it was really good um, and yeah was was great you had 25 what you had 25 celsius what Way too hot late for late March. I, I would agree on you. Er, agree on that front. We have just had rain. And more rain. And wind. So, yeah. The drinks, not the 25 degrees C. Yes, this is true. Um, yeah, they were great. Sam had a... What did you have? Like a, 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 a... I can't remember exactly what was in it, but it was kind of like a fake coffee. Well, not a fake coffee thing, but, um, you know, like a... Um, a drink that was sort of an approximation of coffee, but not coffee, um, that you sort of steeped, um, you, you, you kind of brewed like a Vietnamese coffee and then you stirred it with, um, whatchamacallit, condensed milk. And it was really good. I really liked it. Sam liked it slightly less than me, um, just cause it was quite, as he said, it's it quite an aniseedy flavor. Um, but yeah, it was really good. Very earthy. 
and then the other one was um kind of like a almost like a um a white russian sort of thing um with their local foraged tree sap uh syrup um which is like yeah just it it changes upon, uh, depending on the season um but it's just from various like native trees um and tastes like flipping honeycomb it's so good um but yeah the drink was was really really good and yeah just a really really good idea done with a lot of love a lot of knowledge and really like yeah really really great for people who don't who want kind of a cocktail kind of thing but without any alcohol it's just brilliant and as much care and attention and thought has and like alchemy has gone into the creation of these drinks as would go into yeah a, a cocktail um so yeah it was really really good um so yeah for anybody who's ever in sort of the south of england it's called proudfoot and co um would strongly recommend and i think they do foraging courses and stuff as well which um yeah they ba they basically try and try and bring people into the fold um of hey you should do this too which i definitely haven't been tempted by oh, oh, oh. excuse me and uh we also went to a um well what i thought originally was a bakery i've been walking past it for ages and haven't actually gone in um it's like a japanese bakery slash cafe it's kind of got everything in there um and we went in oh my goodness me they had some amazing stuff really good stuff um cottage core evangelists kind of yeah but um bit the the chap who who runs it reminds me a little bit of trelawney um the beard probably does it he has got quite a spectacular beard um but um but yes so yeah we we've had we've had quite a nice week um and yeah i hope everybody else everybody else has had a decent week as well um we have just rain rain and rain weather wise well actually no it was it was a decent decent day yesterday um <clears throat> excuse me um but yes we have been doing pride and prejudice Pre 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 yes pride and prejudice that's the one so for those of you who i mean there's no excuse at this point you will have caught up um because i've had a week off um from the plot thus far um you've had snow gosh luckily not as much as they'd said you'd get well that's good at least you had 16 two days ago yesterday it was snowing like crazy into minus one and so wow yeah you've had you've had some some weather that is yeah that is the full spectrum <laughs> almost that is yeah slightly crazy everything is fine the 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 earth isn't having a slight panic everything everything is fine and normal sweden has april fool's weather ah nice yeah your weather's been much more calm today which is nice marvelous that is good that is good indeed but work has been silly to make up for it oh no damn it can't win everything alas alack but yes um where have we got to in pride and prejudice so we've um we've been introduced to all the, pretty much all the characters yes all the characters and um oh, oh dear the yawns have started excuse me basically <clears throat> um text oh bums i knew there was something i would i forgot to do ba 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 da ba one second everybody actually i i can't type around my microphone sam will have to do it um i mean the link from last time is just the gutenberg one so 
should be able to um, scroll down for the next chapters. Um, but yes, yeah, so we've been introduced to the Bennett family. We have been introduced to everyone else. Uh, we'll, on, we'll be on chapter 14. Um, Jane has kind of got a little bit of a crush on Mr. Bingley. Um, Darcy apparently has a little bit of a crush on Elizabeth. And basically witticisms, or not witticisms, but just snarkiness has ensued. In, in the politest of ways, of course. Um, you're unable to pin it? Really? I can pin it. How odd. Very strange. Um, but you do it. Oh, no. To be fair, he probably had the link somewhere a little bit more accessibly. Accessibly? Accessible. Blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, basically, Elizabeth and Darcy have been verbally sparring and not a huge amount else has happened. Oh, apart from Jane got ill. She, well, basically she had a cold and she had to stay at Nether, Netherfield? Netherfield? I can remember the names of these things. Um, Mr. Bingley's place had to stay there until she was better. And now finally, um, because Elizabeth went down to sort of, why am I saying Elizabeth? Lizzie um, went down to sort of take care of her and stay with her for a bit and now they're off home um and yes after after lizzie has very much made her displeasure of darcy obvious and uh she thinks likewise so um yes we've had we've had a lot of of um very polite but somewhat snide remarks about Darcy's opinions on women, mainly. And basically both of them... Sorry, I'm just finishing my tea. Basically both of them think that they are somewhat more superior than the other. Can't think where she got the title from. They are both... Proud and somewhat prejudiced. But yes, once I finish molting on my book, if we're all sitting comfortably, if we all have some kind of, I don't know, hot beverage or cold beverage, depending on where the, what the temperature is, um, where you are. If I finish yawning, excuse me, then we shall commence. <clears throat> with Pride and Prejudice Chapter 14 During dinner, Mr. Bennet scarcely spoke at all, but when the servants were withdrawn, he thought it time to have some conversation with his guest, and therefore started a subject in which he expected him to shine by observing that he seemed very fortunate in his patroness. Lady Catherine de Boer's attention to his wishes and consideration for his comfort appeared very remarkable. Mr. Bennet could not have chosen better. Mr. Collins was eloquent in her praise. The subject elevated him to more than usual solemnity of manner, and with a most important aspect he protested that he had never in his life witnessed such behaviour in a person of rank, such affability and condescension as he himself had experienced from Lady Catherine. She had been graciously pleased to approve of both the discourses which he had already had the honour of preaching before her. She had also asked him twice to dine at Rosings and had sent for him only the Saturday before to make up her pool of quadrille in the evening. Lady Catherine was reckoned proud by many people he knew, but he had never seen anything but affability in her. She had always spoken to him as she would to any other gentleman. She made not the smallest objection to his joining in the society of the neighbourhood, nor to his leaving his parish occasionally for a week or two to visit his relations. She had even condescended to advise him to marry as soon as he could, provided he chose with discretion, and had once paid him a visit in his humble parsonage, 
where she had perfectly approved all the alterations he had been making, and had even vouchsafed to suggest some herself, some shelves in the closets upstairs. This is all, that is all very proper and civil, I am sure, said Mrs. Bennet, and I dare say she is a very agreeable woman. It is a pity that great ladies in general are not more like her. Does she live near you, sir? The garden in which stands my humble abode is separated only by a lane from Rosings Park, her ladyship's residence. I think you said she was a widow, sir. Has she any family? She has only one daughter, sorry, she has one only daughter, the heiress of Rosings, and a very extensive property. Ah! cried Mrs. Bennet, shaking her head. Then she is better off than many girls. And what sort of young lady is she? Is she handsome? She is a most charming young lady indeed. Lady Catherine herself says that in point of true beauty, Miss de Boer is far superior to the handsomest of her sex, because there is that in her features which marks the young woman of distinguished birth. She is, unfortunately, of a sickly constitution, which has prevented her making that progress in many accomplishments, which she could not otherwise have failed of, as I am informed by the lady who superintended her education, and who still resides with them. But she is perfectly amiable, and often condescends to drive by my humble abode in her little phaeton and ponies. Has she been presented? I do not remember her name among the ladies at court. Her indifferent state of health unhappily prevents her being in town, and by that means, as I told Lady Catherine myself one day, has deprived the British court of its brightest ornament. Her ladyship seemed pleased with the idea, and you may imagine that I am happy on every occasion to offer those little delicate compliments which are always acceptable to ladies. I have more than once observed to Lady Catherine that her charming daughter seemed born to be a duchess, and that the most elevated rank, instead of giving her consequence, would be adorned by her. These are the kind of little things which please her ladyship, and it is a sort of attention which I conceive myself peculiarly bound to pay. "'You judge very properly,' said Mr. Bennet and it is happy for you that you possess the talent of flattering with delicacy. May I ask whether these pleasing attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment, or are the result of previous study? They arise chiefly from what is passing at the time, and though I sometimes amuse myself with suggesting and arranging such little elegant compliments as may be adapted to ordinary occasions, I always wish to give them as unstudied an air as possible. Mr. Bennet's expectations were fully answered. His cousin was as absurd as he had hoped, and he listened to him with the keenest enjoyment, maintaining at the same time the most resolute composure of countenance, and, except in an occasional glance at Elizabeth, requiring no partner in his pleasure. By tea-time, however, the dose had been enough, and Mr. Bennet was glad to take his guest into the drawing-room again, and when tea was over, glad to invite him to read aloud to the ladies. Mr. Collins readily assented, and a book was produced, but on beholding it, for everything, for everything announced it to be from a circulating library, he started back, and begging pardon, protested that he never read novels. Kitty stared at him, and Lydia exclaimed. Other books were produced, and after some deliberation he chose Fordyce's Sermons. Lydia gaped as he opened the volume, and before he had with very monotonous solemn solemnity read three pages, she interrupted him with, Do you know, Mamma, that my Uncle Phillips talks of turning away Richard, and if he does, Colonel Forster will hire him? My aunt told me her so herself on Saturday. I shall walk to Meryton tomorrow to hear more about it, and to ask when Mr. Denny comes back from town. Lydia was bid by her two eldest sisters to hold her tongue, but Mr. Collins, 
much offended, laid aside his book and said, I have often observed how little young ladies are interested by books of a serious stamp, though written solely for their benefit. It amazes me, I confess, for certainly there can be nothing so advantageous to them as instruction. But I will no longer importune my young cousin. Then, turning to Mr. Bennet, he offered himself at as his antagonist at backgammon. Mr. Bennet accepted the challenge, observing that he acted very wisely in leaving the girls to their own trifling amusements. Mrs. Bennet and her daughters apologised most civilly for Lydia's interruption, and promised that it should not occur again, if he would resume his book. But Mr. Collins, after assuring them that he bore his young cousin no ill will, and should never resent her behaviour as any affront, seated himself at another table with Mr. Bennet, and prepared for backgammon. Chapter 15 Mr. Collins was not a sensible man, and the deficiency of nature had been but little assisted by education or society, the greatest part of his life having been spent under the guidance of an illiterate and miserly father, and though he belonged to one of the universities, he had merely kept the necessary terms without forming at it any useful acquaintance. The subjection in which his father had brought him up had given him, uh, had given him originally great humility of manner, but it was now a good deal counteracted by the self-conceit of a weak head, living in retirement, and the consequential feelings of early and unexpected prosperity. A fortunate chance had recommended him to Lady Catherine de Boer when the living of Hunsford was vacant, and the, res and the respect which he felt for her high rank, and his veneration for her as his patroness, mingling with a very good opinion of himself, of his authority as a clergyman, and his rights as a rector, made him altogether a mixture of pride and obsequiousness, self-importance and humility. Having now a good house and a very sufficient income, he intended to marry, and in seeking a reconciliation with the Longbourn family, he had a wife in view, as he meant to choose one of the daughters, if he found them as handsome and amiable as they were represented by common report. This was his plan of amends, of atonement, for inheriting their father's estate, and he thought it an excellent one, full of eligibility and suitableness, and excessively generous and disinterested on his own part. His plan did not vary on seeing them. Miss Bennet's lovely face confirmed his views and established all his strictest notions of what was due to seniority, and for the first evening she was his settled choice. The next morning, however, made an alteration, for in a quarter of an hour's tete-a-tete -tete with Mrs. Bennet before breakfast, a conversation beginning with his parsonage house and leading naturally to the avowal of his hopes that a mistress for it might be found at Longbourn, produced from her, amid very complacent smiles and general encouragement, a caution against the very Jane he had fixed on. As to her younger daughters, she could not take upon her to say. She could not positively answer, but she did not know of any prepossession. Her eldest daughter, she must mention, she felt it incumbent on her to hint, was likely to be very soon engaged. Mr. Collins had only to change from Jane to Elizabeth, and it was soon done, done while Mrs. Bennet was stirring the fire. Elizabeth, equally next to Jane in birth and beauty, succeeded her, of course. Mrs. Bennet treasured up the hint, and trusted that she might soon have two daughters married, and the man whom she could not bear to speak of the day before was now high in her good graces. Lydia's intention of walking to Meryton was not forgotten, Every sister except Mary agreed to go with her, 
and Mr. Collins was to attend them at the request of Mr. Bennet, who was most anxious to get rid of him and have his library to himself, for thither Mr. Collins had followed him after breakfast, and there he would continue, nominally engaged with one of the largest folios in the collection, but really talking to Mr. Bennet, with little cessation of his house and garden at Hunsford. Such doings discomposed Mr. Bennet exceedingly. In his library, he had always he had been always sure of leisure and tranquillity, and though prepared, as he told Elizabeth, to meet with folly and conceit in every other room in the house, he was used to be free from them there. His civility, therefore, was most prompt in inviting Mr. Collins to join his daughters in their walk, and Mr. Collins, being in fact much better fitted for a walker than a reader, was extremely well pleased to close his large book and go. In pompous nothings on his side, and civil assents on that of his cousins, their time passed till they entered Meryton. The attention of the younger ones was then no longer to be gained by him. Their eyes were immediately wandering up in the street in quest of the officers, and nothing less than a very smart bonnet indeed, or a really new mus muslin in a shop window, could recall them. But the attention of every lady was soon caught by a young man, whom they had never seen before, of most gentlemanlike appearance, walking with an officer on the other side of the way. The officer was the very Mr. Denny, concerning whose return from London Lydia came to inquire, and he bowed as they passed. All were struck with the stranger's air, all wondered who he could be, and Kitty and Lydia, determined if possible to find out, led the way across the street, under pretense of wanting something in an opposite shop and fortunately had just gained the pavement when the two gentlemen turning back had reached the same spot. Mr. Denny addressed them directly, and entreated permission to introduce his friend, Mr. Wickham, who had returned with him the day before from town, and he was happy to say had accepted a commission in their cause. This was exactly as it should be, for the young man wanted only regimentals to make him completely charming. His appearance was greatly in his favour. He had all the best part of beauty, a fine countenance, a good figure, and very pleasing address. The introduction was followed up on his side by a happy readiness of conversation, a readiness at the same time perfectly correct and unassuming, and the whole party were still standing and talking together very agreeably when the sound of horses drew their notice, and Darcy and Bingley were seen riding down the street. On distinguishing the ladies of the group, the two gentlemen came directly towards them and began the usual civilities. Bingley was the principal spokesman, and Miss Bennet the principal object. He was then, he said, on his way to Longbourn on purpose to inquire after her. Mr. Darcy corroborated it with a bow, and was beginning to determine not to fix his eyes on Elizabeth, when they were suddenly arrested by the sight of the stranger. And Elizabeth, happening to see the countenance of both as they looked at each other, was all astonishment at the effect of the meeting. Both changed colour, one looked white the other red. Mr. Wickham, after a few moments, touched his hat, a salutation which Mr. Darcy just deigned to return. What could be the meaning of it? It was impossible to imagine. It was impossible not to long to know. In another minute, Mr. Bingley, but without seeming to have noticed what passed, took leave and rode on with his friend. Mr. Denny and Mr. Wickham walked with the young ladies to the door of Mr. Phillips's house, and then made their bows, in spite of Miss Lydia's pressing entreaties that they would come in, and even in spite of Mrs. P Mrs. Phillips throwing up the parlour window and loudly seconding the invitation. 
Mrs Phillips was always glad to see her nieces, and the two eldest, from their recent absence, were particularly welcome, and she was eagerly expressing her surprise at their sudden return home, which, as their own carriage had not fetched them, she should have known nothing about if she had not happened to see Mr Jones's shop boy in the street, who had told her that they were not to send any more drafts to Netherfield because the Miss Bennets were come away, when her civility was claimed towards Mr Collins by James's introduction of him. She received him with her very best politeness, which he returned with as much more, apologising for his intrusion without any previous acquaintance with her, which he could not help flattering himself, however, might be justified by his relationship to the young ladies who introduced him to her notice. Mrs Phillips was quite awed by such an excess of good breeding, but her contemplation of one stranger was soon put to an end sorry was soon put an end to by exclamations and inquiries about the other, of whom, however, she could only tell her nieces what they already knew, that Mr Denny had brought him from London, and that he was to have a lieutenant's commission in the Shire. She had been watching him the last hour, she said, as he walked up and down the street, and had Mr Wickham appeared, Kitty and Lydia would certainly have continued the occupation. But unluckily no one passed the windows now, except a few of the officers, who, in comparison with the stranger, were become stupid, disagreeable fellows. Some of them were to dine with the Phillipses the next day, and their aunt promised to make her husband call on Mr Wickham and give him an invitation also, if the family from Longbourn would come in the evening. This was agreed to, and Mrs Phillips protested that they would have a nice, comfortable, noisy game of lottery tickets and a little bit of hops, hot supper afterwards. The prospect of such delights was very cheering, and they parted in mutual good spirits. Mr Collins repeated his apologies in quitting the room, and was assured with unwearying civility that they were perfectly needless. As they walked home, Elizabeth related to Jane what she had seen pass between the two gentlemen, but though Jane would have defended either or both had they appeared to be wrong, she could no more explain such behaviour than her sister. Mr Collins, on his return, highly gratified Mrs Bennet by admiring Mrs Phillips's manners and politeness. He protested that except Lady Catherine and her daughter, he had never seen a more elegant woman, for she had not only received him with the utmost civility, but had even pointedly included him in her invitation for the next evening, although utterly unknown to her before. Something he supposed might be attributed to his connection with them, but yet he had never met with so much attention in the whole course of his life. Chapter 16 <clears throat> As no objection was made to the young people's engagement with their aunt, and all Mr Collins's scruples of leaving Mr and Mrs Bennet for a single evening during his visit were most steadily resisted, the coach conveyed him and his five cousins at a suitable hour to Meryton, and the girls had the pleasure of hearing, as they entered the drawing-room, that Mr Wickham had accepted their uncle's invitation, and was then in the house. When this information was given, and they had all taken their seats, Mr Collins was at leisure to look around him and admire, and he was so much struck with the size and furniture of the apartment that he declared he might have almost have supposed himself in the smally, in the small sorry in the small summer breakfast parlour at Rosings, a comparison that did not at first convey much gratification, but when Miss, Mrs Phillips understood from him what Rosings was and who was its proprietor, when she had listened to the description of only one of Lady Catherine's drawing rooms and found that the chimney piece alone had cost eight hundred pounds, she felt all the force of the compliment and would hardly have resented a comparison with the housekeeper's room. In describing to her all the grandeur of Lady Catherine and her mansion, 
with occasional digressions in, place, in praise of his own humble abode and the improvements it was receiving, he was happily employed until the gentleman joined them, and he found in Mrs. Mrs. Phillips a very attentive listener, whose opinion of his consequence increased with what she heard, and who was resolving to retail it all among her neighbours as soon as she could. To the girls, who could not listen to their cousin, and who had nothing to do but to wish for an instrument and examine their own indifferent imitations of china on the mantelpiece, the interval of waiting appeared very long. It was over at last, however. The gentleman did approach, and when Mr Wickham walked into the room, Elizabeth felt that she had neither been seeing him before nor thinking of him since with the smallest degree of unreasonable admiration. The officers of the shire were in general a very creditable, gentlemanlike set, and the best of them were of the present party, but Mr Wickham was as far beyond them all in person, countenance, air and walk, as they were superior to the broad-faced, stuffy Uncle Phillips, breathing port wine, who followed them into the room. Mr Wickham was the happy man towards whom almost every female eye was turned, and Elizabeth was the happy woman by whom he finally seated himself, and the agreeable manner in which he immediately fell into conversation, though it was only on its being a wet night and on the probability of a rainy season, made her feel that the commonest, dullest, most threadbare topic might be rendered interesting by the skill of the speaker. With such rivals for the notice of the fair, as Mr Wickham and the officers, Mr Collins seemed likely to sink into insignificance. To the young ladies he certainly was nothing, but he had still at intervals a kind listener in Mrs Phillips, and was, by her watchfulness, most abundantly supplied with coffee and muffins. When the card tables were placed, he had an opportunity of obliging her in return by sitting down to whist. "'I know little of the game at present,' said he, "'but I shall be glad to improve myself, for in my situation of life—' Mrs Phillips was very thankful for his compliance, but could not wait for his reason. Mr Wickham did not play at whist and with ready delight was he received at the other table between Elizabeth and Lydia. At first there seemed danger of Lydia's engrossing him entirely, for she was a most determined talker, but, being likewise extremely fond of lottery tickets, she soon grew too much interested in the game, excuse me, in the game, too eager in making bets and exclaiming after prizes to have attention for anyone in particular. Allowing for the common demands of the game, Mr Wickham was therefore at leisure to talk to Elizabeth, and she was very willing to hear him, though what she chiefly wished to hear she could not hope to be told, the history of his acquaintance with Mr Darcy. She dared not even mention that gentleman. Her curiosity, however, was unexpectedly relieved. Mr Wickham began the subject himself. He inquired how far Netherfield was from Meryton, and, after receiving her answer, asked in a hesitating manner how long Mr Darcy had been staying there. "'About a month,' said Elizabeth, and then, unwilling to let the subject drop, added, "'He is a man of very large property in Derbyshire, I understand.' "'Yes,' replied Wickham, his estate there is a noble one, a, ten, a clear ten thousand pound per annum. You could not have met with a person more capable of giving you certain information on that head than myself, for I have been connected with his family in a particular manner from my infancy. Elizabeth could not but look surprised. You may well be surprised, Miss Bennet, at such an assertion, after seeing, as you probably might, the very cold manner of our meeting yesterday. Are you much acquainted with Mr. Darcy? 
as much as I ever wish to be, cried Elizabeth warmly. I have spent four days in the same house with him, and I think him very disagreeable. I have no right to give my opinion, said Wickham, as to his being agreeable or otherwise. I am not qualified to form one. I have known him too long and too well to be a fair judge. It is impossible for me to be impartial. But I believe your opinion of him would in general astonish, and perhaps you would not express it quite so strongly anywhere else. Here you are in your own family. Upon my word, I say no more here than I might say in any house in the neighbourhood, except Netherfield. He is not at all liked in Hertfordshire. Everyone is disgusted with his pride. You will not find him more favourably spoken of by anyone. I cannot pretend to be sorry, said Wickham, after a short interruption, that he or any man should not be estimated above their, beyond their deserts. But with him, I believe it does not often happen. The world is blinded by his fortune and his consequence, or frightened by his high and imposing manners, and sees him only as he chooses to be seen. I should take him, even on my slight acquaintance, to be an ill-tempered man. Wickham only shook his head. I wonder, said he at the next opportunity of speaking, whether he is likely to be in this country much longer. I do not at all know, but I heard nothing of his going away when I was at Netherfield. I hope your plans in favour of the Shire will not be affected by his being in the neighbourhood. Oh, no, it is not for me to be driven away by Mr. Darcy. If he wishes to avoid seeing me, he must go. We are not on friendly terms, and it always gives me pain to meet him, but I have no reason for avoiding him but what I might proclaim to all the world, a sense of very great ill-usage and of most painful regrets at his being what he is. His father, Miss Bennet, the late Mr. Darcy, was one of the best men that ever breathed, and the truest friend I ever had, and I can never be in company with this Mr. Darcy without being grieved to the soul by a thousand tender recollections. His behaviour to myself has been scandalous but I verily believe I could forgive him anything and everything, rather than his disappointing the hopes and disgrace, the, disgracing the memory of his father. Elizabeth found the interest of the subject increase, and listened with all her heart, but the delicacy of it prevented further inquiry. Mr. Wickham began to speak on more general topics, Meryton, the neighbourhood, the society, appearing highly pleased with all that he had yet seen, and speaking of the latter especially with gentle but very intelligible gallantry. It was the prospect of constant society and good society, he added, which was my chief inducement to enter the Shire. I knew it to be a most respectable, agreeable corps, and my friend Denny tempted me farther by his account of their present quarters, and the very great attentions and excellent acquaintance Meryton had procured them. Society, I own, is necessary to me. I have been a disappointed man, and my spirits will not bear solitude. I must have employment and society. A military life is not what I was intended for, but circumstances have now made it eligible. The church ought to have been my profession, I was brought up for the church, and I should at this time have been in possession of a most valuable living, had it pleased the gentleman we were speaking of just now. Indeed? Yes. The late Mr. Darcy bequeathed me the next presentation of the best living in his gift. He was my godfather, and excessively attached to me. I cannot do justice to his kindness. He meant to provide for me amply, and thought he had done it, but when the living fell, it was given elsewhere. "'Good heavens!' cried Elizabeth. "'But how could that be? How could his will be disregarded? Why did you not seek legal redress?' 
There was just such an informality in the terms of the bequest as to give me no hope from law. A man of honour could not have doubted the intention, but Mr. Darcy chose to doubt it, or to treat it as a merely conditional recommendation, and to assert that I had forfeited, forfeited all claim to it by extravagance, imprudence, in short, anything or nothing. Certain it is that the living became vacant two years ago, exactly as I was of an age to hold it, and that it was given to another man, and no less certain is it that I cannot accuse myself of having really done anything to deserve to lose it. I have a warm, unguarded temper, and I may perhaps have sometimes spoken my opinion of him and to him too freely. I can recall nothing worse. But the fact is that we are very different sort of men, and that he hates me. This is quite shocking. He deserves to be publicly disgraced. Sometime or other he will be, but it shall not be, by, not be by me. Till I can forget his father, I can never defy or expose him. Elizabeth honoured him for such feelings, and thought him handsomer than ever as he expressed them. But what, said she after a pause, can have been his motive? What can have induced him to behave so cruelly? A thorough, determined dislike of me, a dislike which I cannot but attribute in some measure to jealousy. Had the late Mr. Darcy liked me less, his son might have borne with me better. But his father's uncommon attachment to me irritated him, I believe, very early in life. He had not a temper to bear the sort of competition in which we stood, the sort of preference which was often given me. I had not thought Mr. Darcy so bad as this. Though I have never liked him, I had not thought so very ill of him. I had supposed him to be despising his fellow creatures in general, but did not suspect him of descending to such malicious revenge, such injustice, such inhumanity as this. After a few minutes' reflection, however, she continued, I do remember his boasting one day at Netherfield of the implacability of his resentments, of his having an unforgiving temper. His disposition must be dreadful. I will not trust myself on the subject, replied Wickham. I can hardly be just to him. Elizabeth was again deep in thought, and after a time exclaimed, To treat in such a manner the godson, the friend, the favourite of his father? She could have added, A young man too like you, whose very countenance may vouch for your being amiable. But she consented, contented herself with, And one too who had probably been his own companion from childhood, connected together, as I think you said, in the closest manner. We were born in the same parish, within the same park, the greatest part of our youth was passed together, inmates of the same house, sharing the same amusements, objects of the same parental care. My father began life in the profession which your uncle Mr. Phillips appears to do so much credit to, but he gave up everything to be of use to the late Mr. Darcy, and devoted all his time to the care of the Pemberley property. He was, the most, he was most highly esteemed by Mr. Darcy, a most intimate, confidential friend. Mr. Darcy often acknowledged himself to be under the greatest obligations to my father's active superintendence, and when immediately before my father's death Mr. Darcy gave him a voluntary promise of providing for me, I am convinced that he felt it to be as much a debt of gratitude to him as of affection to myself. How strange, cried Elizabeth. How abominable. I wonder that the very pride of this Mr. Darcy has not made him just to has not made him just to you, if from no better motive, that he should not have been too proud to be dishonest, for dishonesty I must call it. It is wonderful, replied Wickham, for almost all his actions may be traced to pride, and pride has often been his best friend. 
It has connected him nearer with virtue than any other feeling. But we are none of us consistent, and in his behaviour to me there were stronger impulses even than pride. Can such abominable pride as his ever have ever done him good? Yes. It has often led him to be liberal and generous, to give his money freely, to display hospitality, to assist his tenants and relieve the poor. Family pride and filial pride, for he is very proud of what his father was, have done this. Not to appear to disgrace his family, to de degenerate from the popular qualities or lose the influence of, influence of the Pemberley House is a powerful motive. He also has brotherly pride, with which some brotherly affection makes him a very kind and careful guardian of his sister, and you will hear him generally cry, excuse me, cried up as the most attentive and best of brothers. What sort of a girl is Miss Darcy? He shook his head. I wish I could call her amiable. It gives me pain to speak ill of a Darcy. But she is too much like her brother, very, very proud. As a child, she was affectionate and pleasing, and extremely fond of me, and I have devoted hours and hours to her amusement. But she is nothing to me now. She is a handsome girl, about fifteen or sixteen, and I understand highly accomplished. Since her father's death, her home has been London, where a lady lives with her and superintends her education. After many pauses and many trials of other subjects, Elizabeth could not help reverting once more to the first, and saying, I am astonished at his intimacy with Mr Bingley. How can Mr Bingley, who seems good humour itself and is, I really believe, truly amiable, be in friendship with such a man? How can they suit each other? Do you know Mr Bingley? Not at all. He is a sweet-tempered, amiable, charming man. He cannot know what Mr Darcy is. Probably not. But Mr Darcy can please where he chooses. He does not want abilities. He can be a con conversable companion if he thinks it worth his while. Among those who are at all his, his equals in consequence, he is a very different man from what he is to the less prosperous. His pride never deserts him, but with the rich he is liberal-minded, just, sincere, rational, honourable and perhaps agreeable, allowing something for fortune and figure. The whist party soon afterwards breaking up, the players gathered round the other table, and Mr Collins took his station between his cousin Elizabeth and Mrs Phillips. The usual inquiries as to his success were made by the latter. It had not been very great. He had lost every point. But when Mrs Phillips began to express her concern thereupon, he ensured, assured her with much earnest gravity that it was not of the least importance, that he considered the money as a mere trifle, and begged she would not make herself uneasy. I know very well, madam, said he, that when persons sit down to a card table, they must take their chances of these things, and happily I am not in such circumstances as to make five shillings any object. There are undoubtedly many who could not say the same, but thanks to Lady Catherine de Burr, I am removed far beyond the necessity of regarding little matters. Mr. Wickham's attention was caught and after observing Mr. Collins for a few moments, he asked Elizabeth in a low voice whether her relation were very intimately acquainted with the family of de Burr. Lady Catherine de Burr, she replied, has very lately given him a living. I hardly know how Mr. Collins was first introduced to her notice, but he certainly has not known her long. You know, of course, that Lady Catherine de Burr and Lady Anne Darcy were sisters, consequently that she is aunt to the present Mr. Darcy. No, indeed I did not. I knew nothing at all of Lady Catherine's connections. I never heard of her existence till the day before yesterday. 
Her daughter, Miss de Burr, will have a very large fortune, and it is believed that she and her cousin will unite the two estates. This information made Elizabeth smile as she thought of poor Miss Bingley. Vain indeed must be all her attentions, vain and useless her affection for his sister and, pra and her praise of himself, if he were already self-destined to another. Mr. Collins, says she, said she, speaks highly both of Lady Catherine and her daughter, but from some particulars that he has related of her ladyship, I suspect his gratitude misleads him, and that in spite of her being his patroness, she is an arrogant, conceited woman. I believe her to be both in a great degree, replied Wickham. I have not seen her for many years, but I very well remember that I never liked her, and that her manners were dictatorial and insolent. She has the reputation of being remarkably sensible and clever, but I rather believe she derives part of her abilities from her rank and fortune, part from her authoritative manner, and the rest from the pride of her nephew, who chooses that every one connected with him should have an understanding of the first class. Elizabeth allowed that he had given a very rational account of it, and they continued talking together with mutual satisfaction till supper put an end to cards, and gave the rest of the ladies their share of Mr Wickham's attentions. There could be no conversation in the noise of Mrs Phillips's supper party, but his manners recommended him to everybody. Whatever he said was said well, whatever he did done gracefully. Elizabeth went away with her head full of him. She could think of nothing but of Mr Wickham and of what he had told her all the way home. But there was not time for her even to mention his name as they went, for neither Lydia nor Mr Collins were once silent. Lydia talked incessantly of lottery tickets, of the fish she had lost and the fish she had won, and Mr Collins, in describing the civility of Mr and Mrs Phillips, protesting that he did not in the least regard his losses at whist, enumerating all the dishes at supper, and repeatedly fearing that he crowded his cousins, had more to say than he could well manage before the carriage stopped at Longbourn House. And I think there we shall take a break. Thank you for listening so far. Yeah. Yeah, I was the world's nicest guy and he ruined my life for no reason. Which is an appalling impression of um, Emperor Cusco. But yes. Also, hi Umaka. Hope you're well. And hi Zilia as well. Ah, Thunder! Good lord, 31 months. Madness. Uh, welcome in, Thunder. We're just about to take a break. <laughs> um, I hope you're doing well, and thank you very much for the resub. But yes, uh, let us let us go to a break. Go, go do break-related things, and we shall be back in about five minutes. Bye for now.
Tan. Hello. Welcome back. I hope we've all had a good break. And done break related things and stuff. Um Yes. Um I I should shout out subs and things that happened when I was reading. Oh Shyhawk's there. Sup, Shyhawk, yeah, sorry, still no zombies. I'm sure they are here somewhere. Uh Ray Tracer, thank you very much. Oh my goodness me, you've subscribed, subscribed, subscribed. Try that again. For 24 months, that's almost a year. Um, that's an excellent, excellent uh, greeting line, by the way. Ladies and gentlemen, I like that. Very good. Um, and yes, Thunder, of course. Thank you very, very much indeed. Male, maybe the real zombies, the friends you make along the way. Perhaps, who knows? Um, but yes, um, for 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 those of you who are VOD watching, I hope that um, the break music is slightly more kind of in line with the volume of the actual stream. Because um, I know a few of you were, were saying that the break music is significant. I cannot talk significantly louder than stream. So, um, yeah. Gives us a shout if I need to turn it down more. Um, but hopefully that'll have done gone some way to, to make it a little bit more a little bit less of a jump scare when the break music starts. Um But yes, we are indeed back. You're making dinner. Nice. Dinner is always good. Um it is significant. Yep. That's the one. Um, ooh, you're doing an online puzzle. Nice, Lady Mephistopheles. Oh yeah, for anyone who follows me on Instagram, I I posted a, a I didn't post put it on my stories, which will have gone now. Um, a picture of a puzzle that my mum just randomly decided to buy, um, for me and Sam, and so I think Sam did like two bits of it. <laughs> I'm calling him out here. Um, because he didn't feel like doing a puzzle, which is entirely fair. Um, so I did this puzzle and... It, oh no, Sam got the edge pieces. In, as an upper estimate. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Sam, Sam sort of lay on the side of the bed with his head dangling over the jigsaw. Sort of... You did help find the edge pieces, this is true. Um, Sam was sort of channeling his inner cat. Let's Let's just sort of... He was there moral support um but yeah it was a very difficult puzzle actually a lot of fun but um quite a tricky one um but yes succeeded in that whoop, whoop. in the fashion of a 19th century dandy oh good lord you are so far away from being a 19th century dandy <laughs> oh dear you're very, always very enthusiastic about IRL puzzles for about five minutes and then you get bored and wander off yeah Yes, like 200 years away. Yes, that too. Ha ha ha. Um, yeah, like... We, we, we've we been pretty decent, actually. The the last... How many have we done? We did two? One. How many jigsaws have we done together, Sam? We've got one that we still need to do. But there was one we did over Christmas. That was... Another, like, thousand-piece one. And that, that took us what three days something like that um but we, we were pretty committed at that we, we did a pretty good job of that um although there was an edge piece that i remember we took forever to find we got all the edge pieces and then we were just like i can't find this one and got like halfway through the rest of the jigsaw and then finally found it, it as like, oh, for goodness sake um yeah, we've only, okay, we've only done one actually from start to finish. Yes, because we've probably told this story before and I will get back to reading. Um, yeah, we, we started with this other one that Sam's parents are like, oh, we should do this one. We haven't actually done it. Um, so we get it out of its box. We start sort of going through all the all the pieces and sort of thinking them out and like turning them up. So I was like, oh, that's weird. Can you find any edge pieces? No. Huh. Maybe they're all, like, the bottom or something? We go through all of this bloody jigsaw and there's not a single edge piece. Because 
whoever had done it previously had actually opened the box and had actually put all of the edge pieces down on something and then that something had been like folded up and stored away somewhere so it was an entire jigsaw but just with no edge pieces and it took us a long time to realize this mainly because as we were saying the other day it was like we were we were like we, we were just this can't this can't be a thing it could, it's got to have edge pieces in it's got to and so we were just like it must have it somewhere uh it, it didn't it didn't so um yeah we were indeed bamboozled gotta love an 899 piece 899 piece puzzle was that actually calculated is that how many pieces it would be without all the edge pieces nice um yeah we got down to there has to be one i'm going to find it yes exactly we we were we were very determined to find the edge pieces and there were none <laughs> that was um that was an amusing one so yes oh dear we live exciting lives um <laughs> but yes i hope i hope we have all had a decent break um and are either chilling with a puzzle or just chilling i don't know whatever you want um and yeah i think i think if we're um if we're if we're ready to probably hear more of mr wickham complaining about mr darcy who never would speak a bad word about a darcy no never absolute <sighs> anyway if we're all <laughs> ready to uh, continue <clears throat> with chapter 17 Elizabeth related to Jane the next day what had passed between Mr Wickham and herself Jane listened with astonishment and concern she knew not how to believe that Mr Darcy could be so unworthy of Mr Bingley's regard and yet it was not in her nature to question the veracity of a young man of such amiable appearance as Wickham. The possibility of his having really endured such unki unkindness was enough to interest all her tender feelings, and nothing therefore remained to be done but to think well of them both, to defend the conduct of each, and throw into the account of accident or mistake whatever could not be otherwise explained. They have both, said she, been deceived, I dare say, in some way or other, of which we can form no idea. Interested people may perhaps have perhaps misrepresented each to the other. It is, in short, impossible for us to conjecture the causes or circumstances which may have alienated them without actual blame on either side. Very true indeed. And now, my dear Jane, what have you got to say in behalf of the interested people who have probably been concerned in the business? Do clear them too, or we shall be obliged to think ill of somebody. Laugh as much as you choose, but you will not laugh me out of my opinion. My dearest Lizzie, do but consider in what a disgraceful light it places Mr Darcy to be treating his father's favourite in such a manner, one whom his father had promised to provide for. It is impossible. No man of common humanity, no man who had any value for his character, could be capable of it. Can his most intimate friends be so excessively deceived in him? Oh, no. I can much more easily believe Mr Bingley's being imposed on than Mr Wickham should invent such a history of himself as he gave me last night. Names, facts, everything mentioned without ceremony. If it be not so, let Mr Darcy contradict it. Besides, there was truth in his looks. It is difficult indeed. It is distressing. One does not know what to think. I beg your pardon. One knows exactly what to think. But Jane could think with certainty on only one point that Mr Bingley, if he had been imposed on, would have much to suffer when the affair became public. 
The two young ladies were summoned from the shrubbery where this conversation passed by the arrival of some of the very persons of whom they had been speaking. Mr Bingley and his sisters came to give their personal invitation for the long-expected ball at Netherfield, which was fixed for the following Tuesday. The two ladies were delighted to see their dear friend again, called it an age since they had met, and repeatedly asked what she had been doing with herself since their separation. To the rest of the family they paid little attention, avoiding Mrs Bennet as much as possible, saying not much to Elizabeth and nothing at all to the others. They were soon gone again, rising from their seats with an activity which took their brother by surprise, and hurrying off as if eager to escape from Mrs Bennet's civilities. The prospect of the Netherfield Ball was extremely agreeable to every female of the family. Mrs Bennet chose to consider it as given in compliment to her eldest daughter, and was particularly flattered by receiving the invitation from Mr Bingley himself, instead of a ceremonious card. Jane pictured to herself a happy evening in the society of her two friends and the attentions of their brother, and Elizabeth thought with pleasure of dancing a great deal with Mr Wickham, and of seeing a confirmation of everything in Mr Darcy's looks and behaviour. The happiness anticipated by Catherine and Lydia depended less on any single event or any particular person, for though they each, like Elizabeth, meant to dance half the evening with Mr Wickham, he was by no means the only partner who could satisfy them, and a ball was, at any rate, a ball and even Mary could assure her family that she had no disinclination for it. "'While I can have my mornings to myself,' said she, "'it is enough. I think it no sacrifice to join occasionally in evening engagements. Society has claims on us all, and I profess myself one of those who consider intervals of recreation and amusement as desirable for everybody.' Elizabeth's spirits were so high on the occasion that though she did not often speak unnecessarily to Mr Collins, she could not help asking him whether he intended to accept Mr Bingley's invitation, and if he did, whether he would think it proper to join in the evening's amusement. And she was rather surprised to find that he entertained no scruple whatever on that head, and was very excuse me, and was very far from dreading a rebuke either from the Archbishop or Lady Catherine, excuse me again, or Lady Catherine de Burr by venturing to dance. I am by no means of opinion, I assure you, said he, that a ball of this kind, given by a young man of character to respectable people, can have any evil tendency, and I am so far from objecting to dancing myself that I shall hope to be honoured with the hands of all my fair cousins in the course of the evening, and I take this opportunity of soliciting yours, Miss Elizabeth, for the first two dances especially, a preference which I trust my cousin Jane will attribute to the right cause, and not to any disrespect for her. Elizabeth felt herself completely taken in. She had fully proposed being engaged by Wickham for those very dances, and to have Mr Collins instead. Her liveliness had never been worse timed. There was no help for it, however. Mr Wickham's happiness and her own was perforce delayed a little longer, and Mr Collins' proposal accepted with as good a grace as she could. She was not the better pleased with his gallantry, from the idea it suggested of something more. It now first struck her that she was selected from among her sisters as worthy of being the mist mistress of Hunsford Parsonage, and of assisting to form a quadrille table at Rosings, in the absence of more eligible visitors. The idea soon reached to conviction, as she observed his increasing civilities towards herself, and heard his frequent attempt at a compliment on her wit and vivacity, and though more astonished than gratified herself by this effect of her charms, it was not long before her mother gave her to understand that the probability of their marriage was exceedingly agreeable to her. Elizabeth, however, did not choose to take the hint, 
being well aware that a serious dispute must be the consequence of any reply. Mr Collins might never make the offer. Until he did, it was useless to quarrel about him. If there had not been a Netherfield ball to prepare for and talk of, the younger Miss Bennets would have been in a pitiable state at this time. For, for from the day of the invitation to the day of the ball, there was such a succession of rain as prevented their walking to Mer Meryton once. No aunt, no officers, no news could be sought after. The very shoe roses for Netherfield were got by proxy. Even Elizabeth might have found some trial of her patience in weather which totally suspended the improvement of her acquaintance with Mr Wickham, and nothing less than a dance on Tuesday could have made such a Friday, Saturday, Sunday and Monday endurable to Kitty and Lydia. Chapter 18 Till Elizabeth entered the drawing-room at Netherfield and looked in vain for Mr Wickham among the cluster of red coats there assembled, a doubt of his being present had never occurred to her. The certainty of meeting him had not been checked by any of those recollections that might not unreasonably have alarmed her. She had dressed with more than usual care, and prepared in the highest spirits for the conquest of all that remained unsubdued of his heart, trusting that it was not more than might be won in the course of the evening. But in an instant arose the dreadful suspicion of his being purposely omitted for Mr Darcy's pleasure in the Bingley's invitation to the officers, and though this was not exactly the case, the absolute fact of his absence was pronounced by his friend Mr Denny, to whom Lydia eagerly applied, and who told them that Wickham had been obliged to go to town on business the day before, and was not yet returned, adding, with a significant smile, I do not imagine his business would have called him away just now if he had not wished to avoid a certain gentleman here. This part of his intelligence, though unheard by Lydia, was caught by Elizabeth, and as it assured her that Darcy was not less answerable for Wickham's absence than if her first surmise had been just, every feeling of displeasure against the former was so sharpened by immediate disappointment that she could hardly reply with tolerable civility to the polite inquiries which he directly afterwards approached to make. Attention, forbearance, patience with Darcy was injury to Wickham. She was resolved against any sort of conversation with him, and turned away with a degree of ill humour which she could not wholly surmount even in speaking to Mr Bingley, whose blind partiality provoked her. But Elizabeth was not formed for ill humour, and though every prospect of her own was destroyed for the evening, it could not dwell long on her spirits, and having told all her griefs to Charlotte Lucas, whom she had not seen for a week, she was soon able to make a voluntary transition to the oddities of her cousin, and to point him out to her particular notice. The two first dances, however, brought a return of distress. They were dances of mortification. Mr Collins, awkward and solemn, apologising instead of attending, and often moving wrong without being aware of it, gave her all the shame and misery which a disagreeable partner for a couple of dances can give. The moment of her release from him was ecstasy. She danced next with an officer, and had the refreshment of talking of Wickham, and of hearing that he was universally liked. When those dances were over, she returned to Charlotte Lucas, and was in conversation with her when she found herself suddenly addressed by Mr Darcy, who took her so much by surprise in his application for her hand that, without knowing what she did, she accepted him. He walked away again immediately, immediately, and she was left to fret over her own want of presence of mind. Charlotte tried to console her. I dare say you will find him very agreeable. Heaven forbid! 
That would be the greatest misfortune of all, to find a man agreeable whom one is determined to hate. Do not wish me, wish me such an evil. When the dancing recommenced, however, and Darcy approached to claim her hand, Charlotte could not help cautioning her in a whisper not to be a simpleton and allow her fancy for Wickham to make her appear unpleasant in the eyes of a man ten times his consequence. Elizabeth made no answer and took her place in the set, amazed at the dignity to which she was arrived in being allowed to stand opposite to Mr Darcy and reading in her neighbours' looks their equal amazement at beholding it. They stood for some time without speaking a word. She began, and she began to imagine that their silence was to last through the two dances, and at first was resolved not to break it, till, suddenly fancying that it would be the greater punishment to her partner to oblige him to talk, she made some slight observation on the dance. He replied, and was again silent. After a pause of some minutes, she addressed him a second time with, It is your turn to say something now, Mr Darcy. I talked about the dance, and you ought to make some kind of remark on the size of the room or the number of couples. He smiled and assured her that whatever she wished him to say should be said. Very well, that reply will do for the present. Perhaps by and by I may observe that private balls are much pleasanter than public ones. But now we may be silent. Do you talk by rule, then, while you are dancing? Sometimes. One must speak a little, you know. It would look odd to be entirely silent for half an hour together, and yet for the advantage of some, conversation ought to be so arranged as that they may have the trouble of saying as little as possible. Are you consulting your own feelings in the present case, or do you imagine that you are gratifying mine? Both, replied Elizabeth archly, for I have always seen a great similarity in the turn of our minds. We are each of an unsocial, taciturn disposition, unwilling to speak unless we expect to say something that will amaze the whole room and be handed down to posterity with the all, all the eclat of a proverb. This is no very striking resemblance of your own character, I am sure, said he. How near it may be to mine, I cannot pretend to say. You think it a faithful portrait, undoubtedly. I must not decide on my own performance. He made no answer, and they were again silent till they had gone down the dance, when he asked her if she and her sisters did not very often walk to Meryton. She answered in the affirmative, and, unable to resist the temptation, added, When you met us there the other day, we had just been forming a new acquaintance. The effect was immediate. A deeper shade of hauteur overspread his features, but he said not a word, and Elizabeth, though blaming herself for her own weakness, could not go on. At length Darcy spoke, and in a constrained manner said, Mr. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners as may ensure his making friends. Whether he may be equally capable of retaining them is less certain. He has been so unlucky as to lose your friendship, replied Elizabeth with emphasis, and in a manner which he is likely to suffer from all his life. Darcy made no answer, and seemed desirous of changing the subject. At that moment Sir William Lucas appeared close to them, meaning to pass through the set to the other side of the room, but on perceiving Mr Darcy he stopped with a bow of superior courtesy to compliment him on his dancing and his partner. "'I have been most highly gratified indeed, my dear sir. Such very superior dancing is not often seen.' It is evident that you belong to the first circles. Allow me to say, however, that your fair partner does not disgrace you, and that I must hope to have this pleasure often repeated, especially when a certain desirable event, my dear Miss Eliza, glancing at her sister and Bingley, shall take place. 
What congratulations will then flow in? I appeal to Mr. Darcy, but let me not interrupt you, sir. You will not thank me for detaining you from the bewitching converse of that young lady, whose bright eyes are also upbraiding me. The latter part of this address was scarcely heard by Darcy, but Sir William's allusion to his friend seemed to strike him forcibly, and his eyes were directed with very, a very serious expression towards Bingley and Jane, who were dancing together. Recovering himself, however, shortly, he turned to his partner and said, Sir William's interruption has made me forget what we were talking of. I do not think we were speaking at all. Sir William could not have interrupted any two people in the room who had less to say for themselves. We have tried two or three subjects already without success, and what we are to talk of next I cannot imagine. What think you of books? said he, smiling. Books? Oh, no, I am sure we never read the same, or not with the same feelings. I am sorry you think so. But if that be the case, there can at least be no want of subject. We may compare our different opinions. No, I cannot talk of books in a ballroom. My head is always full of something else. The present always occupies you in such scenes, does it? Said he, with a look of doubt. Yes, always, she replied, without knowing what she said, for her thoughts had wandered far from the subject as soon afterwards appeared by her suddenly exclaiming, "'I remember hearing you once say, Mr. Darcy, "'that you hardly ever forgave, "'that your resentment once created was unappeasable. "'You are very cautious, I suppose, "'as to its being created.' "'I am,' said he with a firm voice. "'And never allow yourself to be blinded by prejudice?' I hope not. It is particularly incumbent on those who never change their opinion to be secure of judging properly at first. May I ask to what these questions tend? Merely to the illustration of your character, said she, endeavouring to shake off her gravity. I am trying to make it out. And what is your success? She shook her head. I do not get on at all. I hear such different accounts of you as puzzle me exceedingly. I can readily believe, answered he gravely. That report may vary greatly with respect to me, and I could wish, Miss Bennet, that you were not to sketch my character at the present moment, as there is reason to fear that the performance would f reflect no credit on either. But if I do not take your likeness now, I may never have another opportunity. I would by no means suspend any pleasure of yours, he coldly replied. She said no more, and they went down the other dance and parted in silence, on each side dissatisfied, though not to an equal degree, for in Darcy's breast there was a tolerable powerful feeling towards her, which soon procured her pardon and directed all his anger against another. They had not long separated when Miss Bingley came towards her and with an expression of civil disdain thus accosted her. So, Miss Eliza, I hear you are quite delighted with George Wickham. Your sister has been talking to me about him and asking me a thousand questions. And I find the young man, uh, I find that the young man forgot to tell you, among his other communications, that he was the son of old Wickham, the late Mr. Darcy's steward. Let me recommend you, however, as a friend, not to give implicit confidence to all his assertions. For as to Mr. Darcy's using him ill, it is perfectly false. For on the contrary, he has always been remarkably kind to him though George Wickham has treated Mr. Darcy in a most infamous manner. I do not know the particulars, but I know very well that Mr. Darcy is not in the least to blame, and that he cannot bear to hear George Wickham mentioned, 
and that though my brother thought he could not well avoid including him in his invitation to the officers, he was excessively glad to find that he had taken himself out of the way. His coming into the country at all is a most insolent thing indeed, and I wonder how he could presume to do it. I pity you, Miss Eliza, for this discovery of your favourite's guilt, but really, considering his descent, one could not expect much better. His guilt and his descent appear by your account to be the same, said Elizabeth angrily, for I have heard you accuse him of nothing worse than of being than of being the son of Mr. Darcy's steward, and of that, I can assure you, he informed, informed me himself. I beg your pardon, replied Miss Bingley, turning away with a sneer. Excuse my interference. It was kindly meant. Insolent girl, said Elizabeth to herself. You are much mistaken if you expect to influence me by such a paltry attack as this. I see nothing in it but your own willful ignorance and the malice of Mr. Darcy. She then sought her eldest sister, who had undertaken to make inquiries on the same subject of Bingley. Jane met her with a smile of such sweet complacency, a glow of such happy expression, as sufficiently marked how well she was satisfied with the occurrences of the evening. Elizabeth instantly read her feelings, and at that moment solicitude for Wickham, resentment against his enemies, and everything else gave way before the hope of Jane's being in the fairest way for happiness. "'I want to know,' said she, with a countenance no less smiling than her sister's, "'what you have learnt about Mr Wickham. "'But perhaps you have been too pleasantly engaged to think of any third person,' in which case you may be sure of my pardon. No, replied Jane, I have not forgotten him, but I have nothing satisfactory to tell you. Mr Bingley does not know the whole of his history, and is quite ignorant of the circumstances which have principally offended Mr Darcy, but he will vouch for the good conduct and the probity and honour of his friend, and is perfectly convinced that Mr. Wickham has deserved much less attention from Mr. Darcy than he has received. And I am sorry to say that, by his account as well as his sister's, Mr. Wickham is by no means a respectable young man. I am afra afraid he has been very imprudent, and has deserved to lose Mr. Darcy's regard. Mr. Bingley does not know Mr. Wickham himself. No, he never saw him till the other morning at Meryton. This account, then, is what he has received from Mr. Darcy. I am perfectly satisfied. But was, what does he say of the living? He does not exactly recollect the circumstances, though he has heard them from Mr. Darcy more than once, but he believes that it was left to him conditionally only. I have not a doubt of Mr. Bingley's sincerity, said Elizabeth warmly, but you must excuse my not being convinced by assurances only. Mr Bingley's defence of his friend was a very able one, I dare say, but since he is unacquainted with several parts of the story, and has learnt the rest from that friend himself, I shall venture still to think of both gentlemen as I did before. She then changed the discourse to one more gratifying to each, and on which there could be no difference of sentiment. Elizabeth listened with delight to the happy, though modest, hopes which Jane entertained of Bingley's regard, and said all in her power to heighten her confidence in it. On their being joined by Mr Bingley himself, Elizabeth withdrew to Miss Lucas, to whose inquiry after the pleasantness of her last partner she had scarcely replied, before Mr Collins came up to them, and told her with great exultation that he had just been so fortunate as to make a most important discovery. "'I have found out,' said he, "'by a singular accident, that there is now in the room a near relation of my patroness. I happened to overhear the gentleman himself mentioning to the young lady who does the honours of this house the names of his cousin, Mr. Burr, and of her mother, Lady Catherine.' 
How wonderfully these sort of things occur! Who would have thought of my meeting with, perhaps, a nephew of Lady Catherine de Burr in this assembly? I am most thankful that the, the, the discovery is made in time for me to pay my respects to him, which I am now going to do, and trust he will excuse my not having done it before. My total ignorance of the connection must plead my apology. You are not going to introduce yourself to Mr. Darcy? Indeed I am. I shall entreat his pardon for not having done it earlier. I believe him to be Lady Catherine's nephew. It will be in my power to assure him that her ladyship was quite well yesterday night. Elizabeth tried hard to dissuade him from such a scheme, assuring him that Mr. Darcy would consider his addressing him without introduction as impertinent freedom rather than a compliment to his aunt, that it was not in the least necessary there should be any notice on either side, and that, if it were, it must belong to Mr. Darcy, the superior in consequence, to begin the acquaintance. Mr. Collins listened to her with the determined air of following his own inclination, and when she ceased speaking, replied thus, My dear Miss Elizabeth, I have the highest opinion in the world of your excellent judgment in all matters within the scope of your understanding, but permit me to say that there must be a wide difference between the established forms of ceremony amongst the laity and those which regulate the clergy. For will it give me leave to observe that I consider the clerical office as equal in point of dignity with the highest rank of the kingdom, provided that a proper humility of behaviour is at the same time maintained. You must, therefore, allow me to follow the dictates, dictates of my conscience on this occasion, which leads me to perform what I look on as a point of duty. Pardon me for neglecting to profit by your advice, which on every other subject shall be my constant guide, though in the case before us I consider myself more fitted by education and habitual study to decide on what is right than a young lady like yourself. And with a low bow he left her to attack Mr. Darcy, whose reception of his advances she eagerly watched, and whose astonishment at being so addressed was very evident. Her cousin prefaced his speech with a solemn bow, and though she could not hear a word of it, she felt as if hearing it all, and saw in the motion of his lips the words Apology, Hunsford, and Lady Catherine de Burr. It vexed her to see him expose himself to such a man. Mr. Darcy was eyeing him with unrestrained wonder, and when at last Mr. Collins allowed him time to speak, replied with an air of distant civility. Mr. Collins, however, was not discouraged from speaking again, and Mr. Darcy's contempt seemed abundantly increasing with the length of his second speech, and at the end of it he only made him a slight bow and moved another way. Mr. Collins then returned to Elizabeth. "'I have no reason, I assure you,' said he, to be dissatisfied with my reception. Mr. Darcy seemed much pleased with the attention. He, an excuse me, he answered me with the utmost civility, and even paid me the, excuse me, and even paid me the compliment of saying that he was so well convinced of Lady Catherine's discernment as to be certain she could never bestow a favour unworthily. It was really a very handsome thought. Upon the whole, I am much pleased with him. As Elizabeth had no longer any interest of her own to pursue, she turned her attention almost entirely on her sister and Mr. Bingley, and the train of agreeable reflections which her observations gave birth to made her perhaps almost as happy as Jane. She saw her in idea settled in that very house in all the felicity which a marriage of true affection could bestow and she felt capable under such circumstances of endeavouring even to like Bingley's two sisters. Her mother's thoughts, she plainly saw, were bent the same way, and determined not to venture near her, lest she might hear too much. When they sat down to supper, therefore, she considered it a most unlucky perverseness which placed them within one of each other, 
and deeply was she vexed to find that her mother was talking to that one person, Lady Lucas, freely, openly, and of nothing else but of her expectation that Jane would soon be married to Mr Bingley. It was an animating subject, and Mrs Bennet seemed incapable of fatigue while enumerating the advantages of the match. His being such a charming young man, and so rich, and living but three miles from them, were the first points of self self-gratulation. And then it was such a comfort to think how fond the two sisters were of Jane, and to be certain that they must desire the connection as much as she should do. It was, moreover, such a promising thing for her younger daughters, as Jane's marrying so greatly must throw them in the way of other rich men. And lastly, it was so pleasant at her time of life to be able to consign her single daughters to the care of their sister, that she might not be obliged to go into company more than she liked. It was necessary to make this circumstance a matter of pleasure, because on such occasions it is the etiquette, but no one was less likely than Miss Bennet, Mrs Bennet to find comfort in staying at home at any period of her life. She concluded with many good wishes that Lady Lucas might soon be equally fortunate, though evidently and triumphantly believing there was no chance of it. In vain did Elizabeth endeavour to check the rapidity of her mother's words, or persuade her to describe her felicity in a less audible whisper, for to her express expressible sorry, for to her inexpressible vexation, she could perceive that the chief of it was overheard by Mr Darcy, who sat opposite to them. Her mother only scolded her from being for being nonsensical. What is Mr Darcy to me, pray, that I should be afraid of him? I am sure we owe him no such particular civility as to be obliged to say nothing he may not like to hear. For heaven's sake, madam, speak lower. What advantage can it be to you to offend Mr Darcy? You will never recommend yourself to his friend by so doing. Nothing that she could say, however, had any influence. Her mother would talk of her views in the same intelligible tone. Elizabeth blushed and blushed again with shame and vexation. She could not help frequently glancing her eye at Mr Darcy, though every glance convinced her of what she dreaded. For though he was not always looking at her mother, she was convinced that his attention was invariably, invariably fixed by her. The expression of his face changed gradually from indignant contempt to a composed and steady gravity. At length, however, Mrs. Bennet had no more to say, and Lady Lucas, who had been sorry, and Lady Lucas, who had been long yawning at the repetition of delights which she saw no likelihood of sharing, was left to the comforts of cold ham and chicken. Elizabeth now began to revive. But not long was the interval of tranquillity, for when supper was over, singing was talked of, and she had the mortification of seeing Mary, after very little entreaty, preparing to oblige the company. By many significant looks and silent entreaties did she endeavour to prevent such a proof of complaisance, but in vain. Mary would not understand them, such an opportunity of exhibiting was delightful to her, and she began her song. Elizabeth's eyes were fixed on her with most painful sensations, and she watched her progress through the several stanzas with an impatience which was very ill rewarded at their close, for Mary, on receiving amongst the thanks of the table the hint of a hope that she might be prevailed on to favour them again, after the pause of half a minute, began another. Mary's powers by, but were by no means fitted for such a display. Her voice was weak and her manner affected. Elizabeth was in agonies. She looked at Jane to see how she bore it, but Jane was very composedly talking to Bingley. She looked at his two sisters and saw them making signs of derision at each other and at Darcy, who continued, however, impenetrably grave. 
she looked at her father to entreat his interference, lest Mary should be singing all night. He took the hint, and when Mary had finished her second song, said aloud, That will do extremely well, child. You have delighted us long enough. Let the other young ladies have time to exhibit. Mary, though pretending not to hear, was somewhat disconcerted, and Elizabeth, sorry for her, and sorry for her father's speech, was afraid her anxiety had done no good. Others of the party were now applied to. If I, said Mr Collins, were so fortunate as to be able to sing, I should have great pleasure, I am sure, in obliging the company with an air, for I consider music as a very innocent diversion, and am perfectly compatible with the profession, and is perfectly compatible with the profession of a clergyman. I do not mean, however, to assert that we can be justified in devoting too much of our time to music, for there are certainly other things to be attended to. The rector of a parish has much to do. In the first place, he must make such an agreement for tithes as may be beneficial to himself and not offensive to his patron. He must write his own sermons, and the time that remains will not be too much for his parish duties and the care and improvement of his dwelling, which he cannot be excused from making as comfortable as possible. And I do not think it of light importance that he should have attentive and conciliatory manners towards everybody, especially towards those to whom he owes his preferment. I cannot acquit him of that duty, nor could I think of well of the man who should omit an occasion of his testifying his respect towards anybody connected with the family. And with a bow to Mr. Darcy, he concluded his speech, which had been spoken so loud as to be heard by half the room. Many stared, many smiled, but no, no one looked more amused than Mr. Bennet himself while his wife seriously commended Mr. Collins for having spoken so sensibly, and observed in half a whisper to Lady Lucas that he was a remarkably clever, good kind of young man. To Elizabeth, it appeared, that had her family made an agreement to expose themselves as much as they could during the evening, it would have been impossible for them to play their parts with more spirit, or finer success and happy did she think it for Bingley and her sister that some of the exhibition had escaped his notice, and that his feelings were not of a sort to be much distressed by the folly with which he, mu which he, mu uh, which he must have witnessed. That his two sisters and Mr Darcy, however, should have such an opportunity of ridic ridiculing her relations was bad enough and she could not determine whether the silent contempt of the gentlemen or the insolent smiles of the ladies were more intolerable. The rest of the evening brought her little amusement. She was teased by Mr Collins, who continued most perseveringly by her side, and though he could not prevail with her to dance with him again, put it out of her power to dance with others. In vain did she entreat him to stand up with somebody else and offer to introduce him to any young lady in the room. He assured her that, as to dancing, he was perfectly indifferent to it, that his chief object was by delicate attentions to recommend himself to her, and that he should therefore make a point of remaining close to her the whole evening. There was no arguing upon such a project. She owed her greatest relief to her friend Miss Lucas, who often joined them and good-naturedly engaged Mr Collins's conversation to herself. She was at least free from the offence of Mr Darcy's father notice, though often standing within a very short distance of her, quite disengaged, he never came near enough to speak. She felt it to be the probable consequence of her allusions to Mr Wickham, and rejoiced in it. The Longbourn party were the last of all the company to depart, and by a manoeuvre of Mrs Bennet had to wait for their carriages a quarter of an hour after everybody else was gone, which gave them time to see how heartily they were wished away by some of the family. Mrs Hurst and her sister scarcely opened their mouths except to complain of fatigue, and were evidently impatient to have the house to themselves. 
They repulsed every attempt of Mrs. Bennet at conversation, and by so doing threw a languor over the whole party, which was very little rel relieved by the long speeches of Mr. Collins, who was complimenting Mr. Bingley and his sisters on the elegance of their entertainment, and the hospitality and politeness which had marked their behaviour to their guests. Darcy said nothing at all. Mr. Bennet, in equal silence, was enjoying the scene. Mr. Bingley and Jane were standing together, a little detached from the rest, and talked only to each other. Elizabeth preserved as steady a silence as either Mrs. Hurst or Miss Bingley, and even Lydia was too much fatigued to utter more than the occasional exclamation of, "'Lord, how tired I am!' accompanied by a violent yawn. When at length they arose to take leave, Mrs. Bennet was most pressingly civil in her hope of seeing the whole family soon at Longbourn, and addressed herself particularly to Mr. Bingley, to assure him how happy he would make them by eating a family dinner with them at any time, without the ceremony of a formal invitation. Bingley was all grateful pleasure, and he readily engaged for taking the earliest opportunity of waiting on her, after his return from London, whither he was obliged to go the next whither he was obliged to go the next day for a short time. Mrs. Bennet was perfectly satisfied, and quitted the house under the delightful persuasion that, allowing for the necessary preparations of settlements, new carriages and wedding clothes, she should undoubtedly see her daughter settled at Netherfield in the course of three or four months. Of having another daughter married to Mr. Collins, she thought with equal certainty and with considerable, though not equal, pleasure. Elizabeth was the least dear to her of all her children, and though the man and the match were quite good enough for her, the worth of each was eclipsed by Mr. Bingley and Netherfield. And that is where we shall end for tonight. Thank you for listening. And thank you very, very much, Sean Maul. Thank you so much for the raid. Lovely to see you here again. I hope, I hope, whatever you were streaming, that it was good. Um, and yeah, welcome in. Cold ham. Yeah, oh, I like, I like the, the, the raid shout of cold ham. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, unfortunately, came in fairly near to the end there. But um, yes, thank you all very much for, for coming on in. And I hope you've, Excuse me. Now I've got burps. I hope you've had had a good had a good um, good stream, good time. Elizabeth was the least dear to her of all her children. Well, all right then. I know, right? Mrs. Bennett's Mrs. Bennett's just oh bless her. Meddling doesn't um, doesn't really cover it. <laughs> I also I love the character of Mr. Collins. He's such a pain. He's that one guy who doesn't go away and doesn't shut up. And we've all met one. We all know one. And that is Mr. Collins. I was like, dude, 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 take a hint. Take a hint, please. But yes. But yeah, I hope, I hope, I hope you all enjoyed. Um, ah, it's fun. It's, it's pretty savage in places. I, I do quite enjoy the, uh, not just the social commentary, but just the, the the savagery with which people talk to each other. The sass is is real. It is it is excellent. But um, but yes, that is where we are going to end for tonight. Um, for anybody who has just come in um, and doesn't know who we are. Hi, we are Triliteracy. We read classic fiction that is out of the public domain to you all on a Wednesday and a Saturday evening. And we have a big old archive of all of our stuff that we have done on our YouTube. Which I don't know if Sam's going to do or I will do. Um, we also are on the various social medias. Um, and if you want to support us, because what we do takes time um, and like effort 
Um, we have a Patreon where you can find, which we still need to add more to. We, you can find more professional um, audiobooks, basically, um, where you don't have us chatting through. We, you don't have us, uh, uh, don't have us chatting to chat. You don't have mistakes. You don't have cat interruptions. You have a lovely, professionally done audiobook. Um, so you can go there if you want to have that option. Noises like that, exactly. You don't get any of blah, 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 all that rubbish. But yes, thank you all very much for for coming on, coming on out and having a listen. Um, in theory, we will be back on Saturday, I believe. In theory, um, when but you want cat noises in your audiobooks. Yeah, maybe we should do a just an April Fool's one, which we've missed this year, but oh well, next year, of just cat noises. Just record Joey and go, this is your audiobook. Um, you're expecting to be back on Saturday? Hooray! Yes. Some of you in chat I expect, expect will be at a John's gig. Um, possibly more Mark Twain short stories on Saturday. Oh, that'll be fun. We do like Mark Twain's short stories. They are very satirical and fun. You're all in for bedtime stories with Joey. Yeah. Hmm. Write that down. Um, but yes, thank you all very much for, for being here. Um, let me see. Ah, Stephen is playing Helldivers. Okay. Decidedly unchill. But um, we usually raid Stephen. So we shall go raid Stephen. Um, but yeah, thank you all very much for being here. Go take care of yourselves. Go say hi to Stephen if you want. Um, and yeah, we shall see you back on Saturday. Thank you all very much for being here. Have a good rest of your day, evening, and goodbye.